Uh, hi everyone. <laughs> Welcome to my glorious hotel room in Sydney. I didn't even have a chance to do my hair. Hi, lovely to see you, Craig, Cuddy, Kay, Jeff, Nareem, and everyone else who's on your link. Um, <laughs> thank you, Peter. Peter and I have just had a very exciting half an hour because um, YouTube decided to lock me out until I could double verify who I was and nothing was working. So I've been turning things on and turning things off and reloading things and taking things off phones and I even rang Jeff at one stage because I thought it might have been going through to his phone because it wasn't coming through to my phone. Um, and yeah, here we are <laughs> with two minutes to six, it finally worked. <laughs> Love it. I really need a drink now. <laughs> so who's got, oh, okay. That sounds nice. Pan fried fillet steak, mushrooms and shallots, fried in butter and chips. Yeah. Yum. Connie and John, I've got your burgers. I'm going to turn off my emails because they're binging at me now. Go away. I'm having a glass of Pinot with my friends. So, yes, I'm sorry. I'm not as glamorous as I often can possibly be, which is, um, I know, apart from security, right, Nareem? Very, very disappointing. Um, hang on. I'm going to put some lipstick on. I feel very shabby. Hang on. Oh, this is just breaking down that fourth wall. Having a bit of, uh, what colour is that? D is for danger. I don't think we need any more danger in our lives. Uh, alibi, no, that's no good. Um, oh, jeez. I might have to just give up. Life's too hard. Oh, there we go. I found the right one. I found the right one. And you get to see me put it on now. No glamour here at all. It's my favourite lipstick because it's called Hug Me, which is I need a big hug now after that last half an hour. Peter, if you're on, thank you so much for your patience and being so kind to me when I was trying really hard not to get shouty, but I think I got a little bit shouty towards the end there. At one stage I said, stop talking to me, I'm panicking and my brain doesn't work, <laughs> nothing's working. <laughs> Let's have a glass of peanut. I know, great, everything for you, mate. It's nice, isn't it? It looks better. Haven't done my hair. Oh, well, bad luck. That's what Sydney does to me. It's really hot here. How can you people stand it, you Sydney people? <laughs> Trust me, it goes well with a creamy bacon and mushroom chicken. Jeff and Sue, that is not what I said to Pinot and lipstick. There is something there, absolutely, Karen. Um, and we can talk about that for the, all the ladies that I have a number of different brands of makeup that I use because they don't taste of anything and for and well men as well if you like to wear some lipstick often you'll know that lipstick is perfumed as is lots of other makeup stuff and it gets in the way of the flavor of the wine uh, this is um mac and it's not too perfumed and it's pretty good all right chef andrew has prepared craig you're in the pool today oh, i really should have come over to your house shouldn't i that was very silly of me anyway i am i'm in a little hotel called the Little National Hotel. It's a new it's a new discovery for me. It's right on top of Wynyard Station in I think Clarence Street. Don't quote me on that. But um, it's really cute. It's got nice artwork. Look, I've got a swimming pool myself behind me. I'm in the pool too, Craig, actually. Um, and then it's a very small hotel room. So that's the that's the entrance and there's the telly and there's the window and there's the bed. <laughs> no wasted space. All righty, let's have some wine. Uh, also, I wanted to come back to say how disgusting Sydney is in the heat, says Shell. Excellent. Um, Chef Andrew has prepared for us this evening venison fillet with mushroom and onion in red wine sauce with a side of green beans and sweet potato chips. Yum, delicious. Um, it's it's very um, muggy here today. York Street next door to your office, Craig. Oh, fantastic. Alison, your wine is 22 degrees. That's too hot. Get yourself an ice bucket or an ice sleeve or some way of cooling it down. Stick it in the fridge. 
Um, mine actually just went into the fridge for uh, about half an hour. I got back to my hotel room. I was cruising, thinking I had heaps of time, and then we had our little technical glitch. But anyway, we got there in the end. 2015 Rue Lac Estate Pinot Noir. And I feel a little bit guilty, um, only a little bit, a little bit guilty bringing this whole bottle up. Look, this is my travel glass. I finally managed to sort myself out with one. Um, I think, Alison, you were pretty offended that I was drinking wine out of plastic cups and water glasses last time I was in Sydney. Um, so I have found myself a travel glass. It's not a perfect Pinot glass, but it's a very good wine drinking glass and it's got a little short stem, so it's less likely to break. Short stem, so it's less likely to break. And this actually is one of 14 glasses that I had um, for my that I had for my Master of Wine exam. So I did all of my Master of, Master of Wine exams with these glasses because I had to carry them around with me. I had to bring them to Sydney for the exam or Adelaide or wherever it was. So this glass has already done a bit of travel. It's nice and clean. Let's get some wine in there. So I was just saying I'm feeling a little bit guilty because I dashed off um, to Sydney this morning with this with this here bottle all for myself, um, leaving everyone at Muraduck with the two last two bottles of 2015 um, Muraduck Estate Pinot Noir to fight over amongst themselves. So not quite sure how that's all um, fallen out. I left it with Peter and Jeremy to share them as fairly as they could. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully Megan and Sam, you're on and you've um, got a glass of Pinot and maybe Jeremy, maybe Peter. Um, Pete got stuck at Muraduck trying to help me with my technical issues, so he won't be home yet. Jill and Richard don't know where they are. It's all very exciting. Anyway, I've got my glass of Pinot now so I can relax and talk to you about Pinot. Cheers. So... First of all, I think the colour's terrific. I've been um, – so, uh, Craig, my um, – just in reference to your first comment, my big event is not till tomorrow night. So that's the women in wine tasting at the Sydney Opera House. Um, and it's sold out, so that's very exciting. So if any of you are coming along, you've already bought tickets, then I look forward to seeing you there. And if you haven't, then um, it's sold out. So I don't think you can come. Anyway, that's all right. Uh, there'll be a whole group of women pouring wine for three hours. It'll be it'll be a thing. Anyway, but I've been in the trade today with our distributor and we've been showing the 2020 Estate Pinot Noir and we've been showing the 21 Single Vineyard Pinots um, and a couple of other things. But this, just looking at the colour of this, it's still got a lovely kind of bright garnet colour to it, even though it's got a little bit of age on it. 2015, that makes it nearly nine years old. So that's... Um, that's getting on. And you're right, Craig, I think the nose is, is quite rich um, on this one for an older wine. Um, Leone keeps uh, getting excited and I hope that, I hope Leone, you got a little bit of that 2015 Estate Pinot um, because I know that 15 is one of your favourite vintages from down on the peninsula and I think it's a lovely vintage as well. It's one of those, it's one of those, it's one of those um, it's one of those vintages that we had a really interesting pair. So the first pair was 12 and 13 that we've talked about quite a lot before and then 14 was a bit weird. It wasn't weird. It was just small crop, very concentrated Pinot Noir, um, a bit chunky. And then we had uh, 15 and 16 and they were both beautiful vintages for um, slightly different reasons. And the 15 uh, for me, um, when it was young at least, was my, was my preferred of the two. Um, but that's not everyone's everyone's preference. I think it's holding up really, really nicely. One of the problems about, I mean, this hotel room's lovely. But they've got, I haven't been able to work out where it is, but they've got sort of one of those perfume diffuser things in the room somewhere because the room smells of perfume and it's getting a little bit in the way of me smelling my wine. But I'll get around it. I'll be okay. Um, but I think this wine is looking quite youthful for a nine-year-old wine. It's got a lovely aromatic profile, quite forward, um, really lovely sort of almost there's a red cherry and a black cherry character coming through, but almost a dried cherry character as well. 
There's some slightly biscuity notes as well, um, which is quite nice. As well as those herbal notes that we often see in the Murudaka State um, Pinots. And I think when we get a little bit of age on them, we see that those herbs coming through even more. So for me, it's um, it's rosemary, it's this a bit of thyme, there's a bit of oregano there, but it's mostly rosemary at the moment. It's got that kind of woody, sappy, um, rosemary kind of aromatic, uh, which I think is really lovely. It's also, 15 always had a sort of a Chinese five spice character to it. Um, for me when it was younger and I'm seeing that but sort of in a more dried out kind of star anise um, uh, various um, sort of yeah star anise and a little bit of um, um, cassia bark or cinnamon bark really nice hello lines how are you going got a half bottle fantastic well done um, yeah and and a little bit of morello cherry absolutely Connie and that's coming up quite um, slowly in my little in my little travel glass, it's probably showing up better in a Pinot Noir glass. Um, I've got to say I was quite impressed by this um, this hotel as well as having uh, quite a nice little room and a nice little setup. Um, good Wi-Fi, very important. Um, but they also had some nice wine glasses, so I didn't really need to tote this all the way from Melbourne. But this is probably a slightly better shape than the glasses that they've got. I'll Jump up and grab a couple in a minute, but let me talk about the wine first. Hello, Sonia. How lovely to see you. Back to your Airbnb after lunch at Coriol. Oh, how delicious. Um, enjoyed the pit pool. Yeah, beautiful. Well done. Yum. Um, it's got, it's now, um, oh, so Leonie's talking about tea as well, and I thought you meant tea as in dinner, but I think you mean tea leaves because I'm getting it. I was just about to say I'm getting a sort of a tea leaf kind of aromatic coming up now finally as I'm as I'm sort of getting some air into it. I put too much wine in this little glass as well. I got a bit overexcited. But um and it's a little bit cold because I had it in the fridge. But it better to have it too cold on a hot day like this and warm it up than the other way around. Um, ah, there we go. And there's a little bit of licorice and um ah, what's the other spice there? No, it's eluded me, but definitely licorice, licorice root and um, almost that smell of um, fresh Daryl Lee licorice as well. I don't know. It was one of my childhood, like, favourite things. Um, and it's got that lovely kind of um, molasses-y kind of licorice-y kind of aromatic. Perhaps a little bit of ginger as well, okay. It's quite spicy. It's got some nice spice to it. And then on the palate, it's really, it's kind of cool and calm and collected. It's not jumping around anymore. It's, um, I think the nose is more forward at the moment than the palate, which is interesting. That usually means that a wine is not at its best, which is weird that we're looking at this wine now um, with nine, nine years of age. 16 degrees now, well done, Alison. That's much better. You'll enjoy it a lot better at that temperature. Um, I think um, that the thing about this wine is that the the palate's so balanced that it doesn't it doesn't kind of jump out at you like the nose does. The nose is kind of quite excitable still, but really beautiful perfume. Hopefully, it's got and I think it's got it's got enough kind of weight and body and richness to it to, and particularly with that bit of bottle age as well, for it to work really well with your burgers your steak steak sandwich um i'm very interested to hear what the um what the goodman household is uh is enjoying with their snacks um yeah like yeah ginger like really fresh almost pink ginger um but not the pickled stuff the the new fresh stuff that's really kind of tangy um the acid is definitely holding up well um and looking really lovely. And it's one of the things that I really love about the 15s that they have this kind of weight of ripeness, but it's not overripe and it's got beautiful acid line and the tannins are really velvety. So you get that really beautiful, smooth, um, velvety textural character on the palate, which is really delicious. Mm. I think with a wine like this, particularly if, like me, you've got a little bit cool, 
um, one of the lovely things is to warm it up in your mouth. And so we've talked a little bit about different tasting techniques and I haven't really gone into any of those um, recently, but I think this is a good one to good one to kind of practice with. Um, on the nose, you can smell it, it's fantastic. If you put quite a bit of, um, oh, samosas, mild and meaty, delicious. Um, that sounds pretty good, Craig. Um, I reckon Joan's done you proud again. Well done, Joan. <laughs> um, if, you, if, if it's a little cool and you're not getting a lot from the palate, then if you take, I don't know if you noticed just then, that I took quite a big mouthful. It's not because I'm being greedy, although that might have something to do with it as well. But if you take a good mouthful and then hold it in your mouth for a little bit, and sort of swoosh it around a bit around your tongue, let it kind of sit there for a while so that the warmth of your mouth is warming up the wine and kind of opening up the flavours, you'll get a very different flavour profile than you will if you just take a little tiny sip and let it trickle straight down your throat. So let's do that together, shall we? Mm. And all of a sudden, all of those spices come forward into the palate and you get that little bit of ginger and you get that aniseed and you get that licorice and you get that bit of, um, of uh, cinnamon as well as that really plush, rich cherry character, uh, which I think is just really delicious. And then there's a savouriness to it that is that is reminiscent for me of sour cherries, dried cherries. A little bit of morello cherry in there as well kind of just mixing it up um but it doesn't taste like a cocktail at all it's just got that little note which i think is really delicious and when you do that and you take that sort of you know nice slurp of wine into your mouth and hold it into your mouth and then um just let it kind of trickle down your throat slowly then you get those flavors sort of coating your whole mouth and it's a really lovely way to see how how the length of the wine and how the intensity of flavour works really, really well. Little hit of vanilla, absolutely, Cody. That comes um, probably from the oak, um, but it does that little vanilla kind of thing that kind of brings out the – there's almost a cocoa powder note to it as well. I think it's not chocolatey as such, but there's sort of a bitter cocoa powder note on the palate, which I, which I find really delicious. Kay, thank you for going into your notes. Last tasting of this in 2021, really that long ago. Um, it has more forest floor and meaty notes, bit of violet from your notes, so gone, and more cherry now. Yeah, I don't see as much violet coming through, um, but definitely that cherry, definitely those sort of, um, I want to say sort of baking flavours but without the sugar. So there's spice, there's... Um, it had, oh, had more forest flora and meaty notes. Uh, that's interesting because it's brightened up, hasn't it? Isn't that weird? Like you'd expect a Pinot Noir that's aged for another three years to, or two and a half years if it was the last taste, uh, depends when in 2021 we tasted, I guess. Um, but you'd expect those forest floor meaty notes savoriness to become more intense and the fruit to become more faded and we're actually seeing a complete reversal of that and this is this is one of these things that I'm discovering over the years that Pinot Noir doesn't age and evolve in a straight line always sometimes it will go through a little closed um, the fruit will close down for a little while and then open up again. It's really, um, it's really irritating that that is the case, um, but it's one of those reasons that I think, you know, these wines, if you have somewhere to sell them, it's always worth, you know, stashing an extra, I don't know, however many bottles that you've got space for and that you can afford and that you think is reasonable. Um I'm thinking six bottles, maybe 12 bottles. Don't go too silly. Well, you can go as silly as you like. Don't let me put you off. But um, stashing them in the cellar for that extended period of time because this wine for me is far from being past its best and far from even being close, I think, to um, 
where it's going to kind of hit its peak. So it's, but that said, it's delicious right now. And this is my last bottle. I'm a little bit sad it's my last bottle, but I'm really happy to be drinking it now um, because it's in a really beautiful place. It would be sad if we left it for so long that it all faded and died on us in the bottle and then it wasn't that much fun. Um, Craig, I think I can answer this question without my backup crew. Um, so in 2015, the Muradaka State Pinot Noir would have had fruit I believe, and as, a, as you say, I don't have my backup crew or my books, but I believe this will have some McIntyre fruit, um, probably some Robinson fruit, probably quite a bit of garden vineyard fruit. So I think um, it's possible that that, um, that that garden vineyard fruit's giving it a bit more plushness, but that also might be coming from the McIntyre, a bit of perfume from the Robinson. Um, definitely um, a bit of each of those three vineyards but I'm not sure what the what the breakdown was I have a feeling there was a quite a bit of garden in here because it's just got that kind of garden plushness in the mid palette which I think is really rather lovely um so young with the steak and mushies good K I thought this would be a fantastic steak and mushroom wine and in fact I had steak for steak and chips for lunch today um up here in Sydney at Fix St James, a wine bar and restaurant that I highly recommend to anyone who's travelling to Sydney. It's not the fanciest place, but they always do. It's really buzzy. They always do terrific food. They have a really interesting wine list. You have to be a little bit careful. They're a bit into their natural wine, so you need to, if you don't want a natural wine, you need to sort of talk to the wine waiter. Rather lovely. Um, wouldn't keep it. <laughs> so Anne... And Craig are both saying that they wouldn't keep it, Cody. Um, I'd, be, I'd be tempted. Um, oh, look, I'd, I'd drink. If you've got a couple left in your cellar, I'd probably drink them over the next couple of years maybe. I mean, it's weird because um, I think it's looking better than it did back in 2001 when we last tasted it. Um, and so... If I'd had it in 2001 and I'd gone, oh, yeah, you know, it's kind of getting to the end of its life, blah, 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 um, drink it up, and then you didn't and came back to it now, then I, that would have made a liar of me. And it's it's what shows how it, – it's, it's the thing that shows how difficult this whole ageing wine, wine evolution thing can be. But Anne's right. I mean, Anne, Anne also um, – and I know a lot of you have good sellers, but I know that, Anne, you've got a big seller and you've got things that you've pulled out of your seller recently that um, maybe might have been um, better drunk uh, a little earlier um, than, than you did. And that's, that's much more disappointing than drinking your last bottle of something that you're a bit sad that it's all gone because the last bottle was delicious and you kind of go, oh, I wish I had some more of that. That's a better feeling than opening your, your third last bottle and going, oh, I think it's past it and knowing that you've got two other bottles that you've got to, you know, put in the spaghetti bolognese or um, tip down the sink or give to someone who you think might not be able to tell the difference. None of us would do that though, would we? We don't give people who have who don't just, who are not discerning our bad wines to get rid of them, do we? That would be very bad to do that. Um, yeah, no, I think I actually I actually think I do agree with um, Anne and Craig that as it's opening up in the glass, it's getting a bit plummier, it's getting a bit more savoury. And I think that probably um, the fact that it was that it was best when I poured it out rather than now after I've been talking for sort of 20 minutes. Um, Gift it. Yes, Alison, that's the, that's the other one. Um, <laughs> I don't do that um, anymore. <laughs> Wine marinade outcomes are always disappointing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you, we sell all these wines because we want to know what – we want to enjoy them um, down the track. We don't want them to, sorry, I've just done something weird to my hair. I'm just trying to work out how to fix it, but I'll just leave it alone. It's all, it's all too hard. Um, 
Yeah, I think, um, Craig, what is the oldest version you've had at the Estate Pino? Have you had any gone bad? Oh, far out. You're asking me probing difficult questions tonight, aren't you, as always? Um, if I had Dad here, I'd ask him because he's got a much better memory for that sort of thing than me. I would say um, I have had Pinot, Pinot Noir of ours that is hasn't gone bad. It's just gone flat. It's just not that exciting anymore. Um, the wines that we made in the 1990s, we've still got the occasional bottle of. Um, those are challenged by um, being under cork rather than screw cap as well. So we don't have that um, screw cap guarantee of um, keeping the air out and no uh, no um, cork taint. But I'm thinking that probably, I mean, I've tasted the wines back to the 80s, but the wines, the Pinots that we made in the 80s. So just, just to... Just to um, refresh you on the timeline, the Pinot Noir that we first planted at Muraduck was two rows of Pinot Noir in 1983, and then um, and then the, the the block by the front gate um, in front of the tennis court, we planted out with um, with uh, UC Davis clones that turned out not to be the best clones to grow on the Mornington Peninsula and so those were planted in the late 80s and um, they never made as exciting wine as this. Um, so so partly it was because they were young vines, partly because they were um, not great clones but also in the early days we weren't really sure how ripe was ripe enough and how ripe was too ripe and there was a bit of a belief in the 80s and early 90s that the Mornington Peninsula might be a bit cool um, and that we might struggle to ripen Pinot Noir so we'd leave it to hang for longer. If you leave it to hang for longer, it gets riper, you get jammier flavours, um, but the wine also has less, less natural acidity, less balance and doesn't age for as long or nearly as well as a wine that is not overripe or underripe. Um, so uh, I think anything that we made, and now uh, if Dad's watching, he's probably yelling at the computer right now, but um, I, my feeling is that from the 80s to the 90s, there was a big jump up in quality around 94, 96, somewhere around there. Um, so the mid-90s, there was a big jump up in quality for Pinot Noir for us. And then, um, and I've definitely tasted the 96 and the 98 Pinot not too long ago and the ones that had good corks still looking all right. They're a bit, they're a bit more tired than I would ideally like to drink them, um, but they're certainly not bad, just a bit less vibrant than um, I like my Pinot to be. Um, anything from... 2004 onwards was under screw cap and those wines all have aged very very well uh with the exception of a warmer vintage like um 2010 the 2010s have aged a little bit faster than we expected um but the problem being here craig is that we don't tend to hold back the estate pinot noir in the way we hold back bits and pieces of the single vineyard wine because it's just it's not practical to have a museum of everything that we've ever made. And so being selective, the Estate Pinot Noir is always more ready to drink as a young wine. And so we sort of say, okay, that's the wine that we we make and we sell and we drink and once it's gone, it's gone. The single vineyard wines, because they're a bit more complicated and because um, if you haven't tasted them with age on them, then I don't think you have the whole story of the single vineyard wines. Um, those wines we've held back because we think they're more uh, focused examples of the of the vineyards, and by dint of them being um, more expensive wines, we do select out um, a parcel of fruit that we think is particularly special, particularly good, 
um, and has particular potential to age better than maybe the maybe the estate wine. I, I think probably with hindsight, if we had more storage, we probably should hold back some estate wine. But um, we're still we're still a relatively young business, and cash flow is still quite important to us. So if we're holding back all of the wines that we made um, to see how they age, and I think having the opportunity to taste them with a group like you guys, oh, there's no other group like you guys, your group, um, then today we've got, we had 15, someone's just dropped off, so we had, we've got 14 people um, who are engaging with this live. We've had, we've sold um, more than double that many packs. So, um, so there's, so there's a, there's a little gang of you guys out there tasting these wines with age on them, but most people, most people don't care, um, which is okay as long as they think the wine's delicious when they drink it and come back and buy more and then drink it and come back and buy more and then drink it again. Then that makes me very happy. But it makes me very happy also to look at these wines with age, and they look delicious um, when they've aged well. K, okay, we had a 2004 estate Pinot Noir in September 2021, and it did stand up well. Um, it was a woman than average average. Uh, November, December in 2023, and you're volunteering to hold some for us. Thank you, Kay. That's very kind of you. So um, remembering that the 04 was the first. <laughs> hmm, I, it's, uh, yeah, we could just kind of billet the wine out to various um, sellers. Uh, we And most people don't have sellers to store wine properly, so drink now is is really the key, as Anne, as Anne has pointed out. Um, um, yeah, the 20, 2004 was the first estate Pinot that we put under screw cap, so that's why we would have. That's why we went that far back, but no further, because the wines under cork. Um, we did actually do an older wine, an older Pinot under cork, but I think it was very like some. One of you guys had a cork version. Some of you had Oxford. Anyway, needless to say, the wine that we're making today is so much better than we, the wine that we made back in the early noughties that if you do want to put the wine in the cellar and age it, then, you, then you're very safe doing it for at least 10 years. But if you just want to buy it and drink it, then that's also absolutely fine by me. I think really what most people will do. So, Craig, update on vintage. Anything particularly exciting? Well, we have um, picked... If Jeremy is listening in, or if um, or if uh, one of our Oregonians is um, listening in, you can correct me. But I think we've probably, um, I think we've probably picked everything except for the Shiraz. Could be. I know that Dun Duns Creek uh, Pinagree, which goes to um, the Pinagree on Skins, uh, and is a bit further south, so tends to ripen a little bit more slowly than some of our other vineyards. We picked that yesterday and that was processed today um, for Pinot Ground Skins. So we're making, um, and I haven't seen it yet, but I've been told that it's looking terrific. So I'm quite excited about that, fingers crossed. Um, I'll be checking that out on Saturday when I get back to Muradak. Um, but, yeah, Pinot Ground Skins is, uh, should have been um, distemmed and into fermenters today. Uh, and I think we might have picked the Duns Creek Pinot Noir, but I'm not sure that I think I think that's come in. So yeah, I think everything's in the winery now, um, apart from dribs and drabs. A uh, little bit of a um, little bit of um, contract winemaking that we do for people who are a bit further south than us might still be waiting to come in. Um, Shiraz is still ripening. The 10 vines of Nebbiolo um, are doing well and still ripening alongside the Shiraz. So um, very, uh, very, very um, exciting about that. Uh, the, new Shiraz, the new Nebbiolo vines are growing nicely in their first year, so they're looking good. Um, oh, Alison, you're saying that you're – so so your, um, your wine came from your basement and was 22 degrees in the heat. Yeah, it's tough. Um, and installing the wine temperature humidity control was the best decision for you. Absolutely. I would imagine 
Um, that again, also the the three days of thirty nine over the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I bet you could have done it yourself if you wanted to. But I think those things are probably good to get someone else into to to install them. Um, oh, the spice is coming through now. It's really it's really intriguing. This wine's kind of circling back on itself. It's it's got sort of a mulled mulled wine spice kind of aromatic coming through now, which is rather lovely. Um, but I was going to say with um, with a heat and humidity um, control in a cellar or a basement or whatever. Um, the further north you go in Australia, I think the more important that is because um, you guys here in Sydney, I know this is this has been quite a cool day for you, um, or this is what I've been told by everyone that I've seen, that it's been quite a nice day and, um, and it's been so hot this summer. Um, and not only is it hot, but it, it gets hot and steamy um, and that combination of humidity and heat can be really bad for, um, well, it's not bad for wine ageing, it just... It just um, shortens your wine's ability to age, so it'll age faster in warmer climates. Um, if it gets up above sort of, you know, if it gets hot, then then you've got problems with the flavours being um, irreconcilably sort of changed. Um, so if you have your wine sort of somewhere in the house where it gets to 39 degrees this weekend in Melbourne, for example, then that wine's never going to recover from that. But if it's going, if it's going up to, if it's going up to 22 degrees and down to 15 degrees over the, over the um, year, then it's not going to kill the wine straight away, but it's just going to shorten its lifespan in the bottle. Mm. Kay is saying that she's just poured another glass, so I'd better do the experiment myself. And the meaty notes from the previous tasting are present, strong cherry and pastrami. Awesome. <gasps> Wish I had some pastrami. How are your burgers going? Are they all eaten? <laughs> I can't complain. I've had a very nice day. I'm going out. Oh, yeah. The, well, for me, the cherry, definitely. Oh, yeah, definitely some meaty kind of notes. There's almost a... There is definitely a pastrami kind of beefy kind of character, which is what I was thinking was going to work with your steak and your mushrooms and your hamburger and your and your venison and all of those kind of things. It does have a peppery spice to it as well. But again, on the palate, that juicy cherry fruit is just gorgeous, really special. Um, I think, Kay, um, whenever I re-pour a wine from a bottle, particularly if it's a bottle with a bit of age on it because they develop so much faster once you open them, then, you, you know, you have a glass and then you pour another glass and you get completely different characters coming through. And it's probably those characters in the second glass that tell you how much longer it's going to age because that's how, that's how that wine has evolved as soon as the airs hit it. Um, the fact that it's still delicious and that it's still kind of changing and evolving means to me that it's going to age probably quite well um, for a little bit longer. But you probably don't need to keep it for more than a more than another two or three or four years. Well, who knows? Um, but fifteen is a beautiful vintage. Um, I'm really pleased to be sharing this last. These last few bottles of 2015 Merlac State Pinot Noir with you guys tonight um, and anyone else who tunes in later on um, to, to do this tasting not live, that's that's all good as well. Um, we have come to the end of box number one. It's amazing, I know, uh, and we managed to do this in Sydney, which is great. I know, Shell, so many tears, but tears of, tears of joy, hopefully, mostly. Um, box number two is out and about. Um, if you haven't ordered it, then uh, have a look at it. It's pretty exciting. Um, there's a couple of really brand new wines, and I've just been taking the Devil Bean Creek Pinot Noir around Sydney today, and it's such a lovely wine. It's got a kind of, it's got this almost liqueur cherry brightness and richness to it. It's really, really um, juicy and crunchy and beautiful. I have to think of the perfect food and wine match for that wine, but that's going to be exciting. We've got the Devil Bean Creek 
Chardonnay, which um, 2023, which we made tiny quantities of. I think it was like 200 dozen of, so stupid, and allocated all of it apart from the um, wine that I kept back for you guys um, to have a bottle each. Uh, we've allocated the rest of it all out to our distributors and they're all grumpy with me because there's not enough. Um, we're going to be looking at the Pinot Grillon skins from 2023, which is looking delicious for those of you who haven't tasted it yet because we released it sort of over, over the Christmas break. Um, it's, I'm very excited about that wine, um, so that'll be fun. Got a couple of other wines that we were visiting and the 2015, the Muraduck McIntyre Pinot, um, which I just thought after having this wine in this box, and we tasted the 15, the Muradak McIntyre Pinot. I know we've tasted it together before and we tasted it last year um, at one of Jill's lunches and it's a beautiful wine and we just had a little bit of it left. So I thought that would be um, a really fun treat to kind of slip in to the box. So that's all coming up. We have a break between boxes next week and we haven't, I haven't come up with a an idea of what we want to drink together. Um, Pinot Ground Skins 2023 Craig. At the moment, we have good stock, but it's selling it's selling fast. Um, yeah, it's we've got good stock at the moment, but it is moving through fast. It's not going to last all year, I don't think. Um, but we should have some for another um, at least another couple of months, hopefully. Um, yes. Uh, Alison, you're not here next week. Oh, well, then you don't get to vote on what we drink together. <laughs> what we don't drink. Oh, yeah, you do, absolutely. Um, Peter Green's means I'm very excited about the new one. Um, so I was thinking, I was tossing up between, um, well, I haven't managed to organise the mezcal yet. I'm still um, pack out box three with it. Yes, Craig, absolutely. Um, I am still talking to um, my Mezcal supplier about the best way to get the Mezcal to you guys. So I'm hoping it will do that um, at the end of box two. Um, if there is, let me have a think about it. If there's, I'm going, I'm actually going out for a drink with a friend later tonight. So I might find a fabulous cocktail that we need to share next week. Otherwise we might, we might choose a great variety that we haven't talked about yet. Um, let me have a bit of a think, but if anyone's got any votes um, on what you'd like to get together to drink next week or if you'd like a week off because that's always a possibility as well if you <laughs> but um but i'll be I'll be doing vintage be very be be very excited to catch up with you guys for a drink. Um, I might even talk to the guys from Oregon and see if they've got anything that they'd like to suggest seeing as how um, they're here as well. Anyway, I think um, I might leave you there. And uh, if you've still got a little bit of that Pinot Noir, the earthiness, Etna Rosso, Craig, of course. Um, yes. All right. Let me have a think about that. I had a, I think some Etna Rossos are delicious. I had an Etna Rosso um, last week that was so bretty. I just, I couldn't even. So, um it's not a bad suggestion though. I'll let me let me have a look and see what's easily accessible. Because the other thing is that I've got some friends who bring in some nice Italian wine and um, they bring in a very nice Etna Rosso that I could put in as a guest wine into one of the um, future boxes as well. So uh, let us I shall I shall deliberate on that and um, I'll get back to you on Monday, if not sooner. Um, with my recommendations for what we're going to get together and drink next week. All right, guys, thank you so much. Lovely to see you. It's great to be here in Sydney in my lovely little hotel room. Um, and I will talk to you all soon and I'll see as many of you in person as I possibly can as soon as I possibly can. Thanks very much. And, Kay, it was lovely to see you guys um, at Muraduck to check out the Check out the winemaking. Jeff and Sue came by. If anyone feels like swimming by, there's always stuff going on at the moment, so do come and see us. I will enjoy paradise. Thank you, Craig. I'm going to come jump in your pool now. No, I'm not. It's too late. I've got, a, I've, got, I've got other things that I have to do. But 
one of these days. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Glad you loved the match tonight, Shell. Um, thanks, everyone. It was uh, it was really good. And I'm sorry for the uh, the very late link, but um, it was exciting at this end as well. So I'm glad that we managed to make it happen. It was I was this this close to sending you an email saying sorry, we're not. It's not. It's not going to happen tonight. So here's to technology. Woo! <laughs> thanks, everyone. Bye.